Hey, Brad, I wanted to ask you real quick. I mean, I know you're from, you have a military background and thank you so much for your service in the Navy. I, I know I didn't get into that and I apologize for that. Um, you know, there's just so much to talk about with this case, but I know that your skill set with the Navy, you talked about working with the dogs, the cadaver dogs and all of your experience. How important is that to have uh, in a missing persons case? I, I mean, I'm talking about anything here in general. It doesn't have to mean these two kids or any, but any of these cases where you get out there within the, the first 48 hours and do those searches. But beyond those 48 hours, right, you know, now we're talking about we're almost close to day 70 here with these boys. So it's gone beyond the 65 days of Polly. Um, you know, is, is it still possible to use dogs out in the Mojave Desert and Bakersfield is 90 miles away? Now we have all of this, this zonage. Talk about the, 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 you know, the hindrance that can be with the mileage in between and the, all the different areas these kids could have been. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, you know, for every homicide detective, and, and I'm sure Bill will say this, uh, you know, they need a large toolbox to be able to apply to these cases. Uh, these canines are one set of tools. Uh, the different technology resources that we have today or other sets of tools. I'm sure that they are applying all of those tools into this. Uh, as far as time frame goes, I mean, yeah, the more time that this exists out there, especially in a, a desert environment, is the more time that odor has a chance to deteriorate. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to really depend upon what kind of resources that you're really trying to talk about. This time period going into it, as far as we are, uh, you know, you're probably looking at the use of, like you said, uh, cadaver dogs or what we now term human remains detection dogs. Uh, and they're, they are still looking for that odor. They're looking for the odor of human decomposition. They can do that in a lot of different locations. They obviously have applied those, uh, that tool set inside of one of the homes. Uh, I think that you mentioned that earlier. The police chief in California City, I had a few conversations with him on the phone uh, and I saw some interviews and it he was talking about people coming in with cockamamie leads, you know, sending his officers on a wild goose chase. That does nothing good. You know, um, you have psychic mediums who are getting readings and doing this and that. And they, they're calling these they're calling these tips in to the dispatch. And he talked about taking valuable resources going out on kind of wild goose chases, if you will. Did you have a lot of that happen in Polly's uh, case, Brad? Uh, or do you want to speak about it more? Yeah, absolutely. I think we have those in pretty much any of, I mean, any time that you get uh, a lot of high profile media attention in a case, you're going to obviously get uh, the opposite side of what you're after. Uh, just like Bill stated before, anytime that we can utilize the media and we utilize them correctly and we partner the families with law enforcement and they have a joint message as they go forward, the media becomes a force multiplier. But when you are not utilizing that properly and you're not giving them the right narratives, then they're going to create the narratives. And as they create the narratives, you create all of this other stuff. Uh, Mark turned this a long time ago. It's the second wave of predators that then comes in and begins to affect your investigation. And what a lot of people don't realize is, is every time they make that phone call into dispatch or into 911 and report that erroneous tip, uh, they don't realize that that has to take resources away because that investigative team has to run that tip down. Uh, talk about some of your accomplishments, some of the things that you uh, are doing. Well, I don't know. I mean, accomplishments, everything is a collaborative effort, it seems to me. Um, and I think Brad will agree with that, that, that we've been involved in many, many cases that have been solved. We've been involved in many legislative efforts that have been successful. Um, but I, I'll tell you, Ron, I'll tell you what I think. I, I think that, that, that Paulie's death and the significant uproar afterwards, and I think some of the lobbying that I did, um, played a significant part in changing the crime climate in the United States and ultimately bringing that that, that whole crime statistic, cutting the crime statistics in half. For instance, one of the things that I did in New York, um, and I was working with Dean Skelos, who unfortunately found himself in the, in the wrong place at one time, and, and, and uh, Governor Pataki on Megan's Law. 
And we were having a dickens of a time getting Megan's Law onto the floor of the legislature because it was a heavily Democratic um, legislature at that time. And uh, we, we had a, ultimately a confrontation with a guy named, I think his name was Sheldon Leonard. Was that his name? The Speaker of the House? Sheldon Silver? Sheldon, Sheldon Silver. Sheldon Silver, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, he wound up going Silver. to prison, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I know where he belongs. And anyway, it was Maureen and myself, Maureen Kanka, Megan's mother and myself, basically confronting this guy and saying, listen, if this was your daughter, would you be sitting back like this? Right. Or would you be demanding some kind of an action? And ultimately, I think that argument got the Megan's Law onto the floor of the legislature where it passed handily and was subsequently signed by, uh, by, by, by Governor Pataki. So we were involved in a lot of things like that um, for many, many years. But then different people come into power, different priorities are found, and we found ourselves where those kinds of goals were no longer being pursued. So we had to change. And that's basically when one of the things we did was ask Brad to come work for us so that we could have maybe more tangible results, right? Having actual boots on the ground and being able to say, well, there's that missing person, whatever that might mean. And it could mean several different things. Um, and then helping families one at a time instead of helping all of the families at one time. If, if, if you know what I mean. And oh, there's nobody else, there's nobody better at doing that anywhere in the country than Brad. There just isn't. He's proven himself time and time again. Brad, you're a boss. You are a boss, Brad. Thank you for that. Um, like, what type of uh, uh, interactions did you have with the police? And was it a positive thing? Were you cooperative? Everybody wants to know these things. Well, first of all, yes, I was very, very cooperative with them. I, um, uh, I, I told them right up front that they could ask me whatever they wanted as many times as they wanted, uh, that I'd be willing to take a polygraph exam, that uh, I'd be willing to dance naked on the table if that's what they needed. And they definitely said they wouldn't need to go there. Um, a couple of things happened while Polly was missing. They, they, they told me two different things. They said, number one, I won't hear about anything significant in the case from the media that they'll tell me before the media tells me. And they were really good about that. Sometimes it would be 10 minutes before something appeared on a headline, but at least I heard it from them first. So I was never blindsided by any media reports. And in fact, those media reports that would have blindsided me, I was able to dismiss knowing that I hadn't heard about it from the police, particularly in the later days when basically any reporter that found a dog bone on the side of the street would uh, would break into the newscast and say, we have breaking news on the Pauly Class story. You know, um, Mark, you know, Mark, it's, a, it's amazing that uh, when the when the media doesn't know something, they'll simply make it up. And when you know the facts, and they start reporting this crap. You're like, where did they get that from? You know. Well, part of it is I didn't have any facts, and that, 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 but the other thing that they told me, they told me number one that I would hear everything from them, and the other thing they told me that was very, very significant was that I had a contact within law enforcement that I could come to with anything I wanted. Um, so I knew that I had that open communication, and I knew that they would tell me before I heard it on the media. But beyond that, it was not a good relationship because my feeling every day for 65 days is that they need to tell me where my daughter is. They need to solve this case. And if they haven't solved it by the end of the day, then they haven't done their jobs. Now, I was looking at it through a very, very narrow focus at that time, obviously. Um, and very emotional. But, but it, it, it really did break down our, our relationship. There was maybe two cops that I could go to. One of the police officers, one of the local captains was trying to get my ex-wife and I back together, which was a total and complete distraction. Um, another one, um, because I knew nothing about these things, another one, Eddie Fryer, the FBI agent, I, I kept going to Eddie saying, Eddie, you need to check this out. You need to check this out. I... I 
heard that this is a really good place to look and basically was taking every psychic prediction that hit my ears to the law enforcement, to the FBI, to the point where they finally had to say, you know, listen, these people never help in crimes. They don't find anybody. They basically all tell you the same thing and hope that it's somehow going to result in them getting a piece of the reward. So I, he very quickly set me straight on, on the psychics. Um, but the, the, the relationship was absolutely horrible. A few days before we found Polly, in fact, or before the, the police located her remains, um, after they had arrested the, the killer, um, they said to me and Polly's mom that, we have to get used to the idea that we'll never see her again and that she's probably dead. And uh, I went right through the roof. I was so angry with them. I was throwing things around the room. I was really in a, it was, I was in such a terrible state at that point. Um, but it proved, it turned out that everything they said was correct. But the idea that they don't share information with you, whether they have it or not, and that this can go on for months and months and months, never helps a relationship between a victim's family and a law enforcement agency. Yeah.